So this is, again, it will be technical. It's about how we get the diffuse global illumination in real time for games. And it's a technique that comes from offline rendering. And the question is, how can you evolve these techniques to become real time? So it's about massively parallel path space filtering work that I did with my colleague, Nikolaus Binder. If you go for path tracing in real time, then you get something like the left image, and you saw also the images by Alexei. It's not enough to do that. And that's why offline rendering is called offline rendering, because you're tracing many more paths to connect the camera and the light sources to learn what the light transport really is. So if you take more samples, like the 16 samples per pixels, then it's already a little bit better, and still you can see some noise. But actually, at this moment, even with our hardware, you do not have this time per frame. And so the reference on the right is totally smooth. It's, of course, overkill, but this is to show you the difference between a converged solution and the budget that you have. So the question is now, how can you do this? And this is what I'm going to introduce here. So the idea of making all these algorithms fast enough for real time is, of course, you compromise. So what you're looking for is all the paths that connect the camera or the eye to the light sources in order to account for all the light that's coming onto the screen. And the question is, so since we invented, uh, or since we were selling ray tracing hardware, we did not really invent it, but uh, <laughs> now we have it in fast. The question is, what are the compromises to make this go real time? So, and what you usually do is, when you look at the point in space, you may look at a mirror surface, so you have a reflection here on the ground, you're looking on the water surface, and then of course, you wanna have the light at the end of the ray, as in the previous talk, which is on the top of the ceiling. And how do you get this light? Alexei was mentioning that. Usually what you do is to collect the light over the hemisphere so that you know how bright it is there. And this is of course super expensive. This algorithm is classic in Monte Carlo sampling. It's called splitting, and it just multiplies the time you need by the number of rays that you split off from this one point. And this is of course not affordable. So, but if you look at what's happening in total, not only for this one path that I showed before, but if you look at all the paths that you shoot from the eye into the scene, then of course you see that actually you can emulate this a little bit. Instead of splitting it off, what you can do is you share with your neighbors because you will have many similar paths going across the maybe specular floor if you look at the water. And so the algorithm now proceeds in three steps and then I will explain you how this all works. So first of all, we generate all the paths and it's paths without splitting. So if you look precisely at the ceiling, this is not splitting. It's only paths that have similar hit points and from there I scatter one more. So, and then of course, I need to store this information. So on the top of the ceiling, I store all the points with the light that is incident there. So what I do then is, I average this light in a data structure, and after that, in order to compute the contribution of this one path that interests me and all his neighbors, I'm just querying here for the averages. And so this sharing gets you rid of the complexity of splitting. So just as a comparison, yeah, these are all different hit points from neighboring paths that you have to shoot anyhow because you want to render a whole image, and this is what it should be. But if this distance here is small enough, then probably will work. And so I wouldn't do that if it wouldn't work. So what does this require? This requires something like a neighbor search. So if we abstract, so just imagine you're looking at the ceiling now where all these different paths are incident, then this is what you get. You get all these different color samples, so all the incident light in this circle. And what you want to do is in this circle, you want to average. So of course, it's all known how to do this. You would do an extra data structure so that you can do a range search to identify who is close to the center of my circle where I want to compute this average. But this is, of course, quadratic. You have to scan all the neighbors, and you have to process everybody who is inside this disk area. So, and this is too expensive, yeah? Because for each vertex, you have to do the range query. So, and the principle now is the following. So, we do this in an abstract way. So let's assume we have some collection of samples in a plane, and we want to compute the smoothed version of this one, so the approximation of the real function that we would see. One way to do that is what I said before. For each pixel on this noisy image, we just average over its neighbors. 
Well, then you get something that's smooth and it's super expensive. Or you don't do this quadratic searching. You just say, okay, I'm going to discretize and I'm averaging per cell. And then, of course, it's super cheap because each hit point is touched only once. You average in the cell and to render the image, you just query the cell. So it's linear complexity in the number of pixels. Then, of course, you say, but it looks discretized. And yes, it looks discretized, so it's not what you want to use. So the question is, how do you do that? Anyhow, the principle is we're sharing with the neighbors, we are avoiding the range search, and then we can get faster, and uh, still a little bit of a problem left is get rid of the discretization. So how do we get rid of the discretization? Well, the input is the noise, then we average for a discretization, and in order to get rid of the discretization, we do jittered excess. So instead of accessing this for the pixel where we want to query it, we add a little bit of jitter. And so the discretization is hidden in noise. And then you might ask, but you just wanted to get rid of the noise. Yes, but you will agree that the noise on the right is much less than the noise on the left. And the noise on the right is guaranteed uniform, which means it's easy to filter. And so by the work that has been used for the Quake 2 ray tracing work, especially by the work that Christoph Schiet did in his two HPG papers, you can do this filtering easily. Yeah? Just go to the source code, get it, and do it.